Hi friends, uh, again I am Dr. A.S. Prasad from Kanpur. I have been posting various surgical videos on the YouTube and this time again I am going to post a YouTube video of a total knee replacement done in a virus team. Normally I do like to talk always from the operation theatre. This is the first time I am trying to talk from outside. Because of the COVID times my voice it doesn't come out at all with all the mask and shield, the respirator which I use. So even the surgery which I have recorded, it will have a voiceover from me just explaining what I have done and what was going, even going inside my mind. Maybe I'll see if it works better. So next surgery is also I'll go with a voiceover. And this is also a COVID times which will go shortly. So this is the patient, a lady more than 72 years of female, lot of osteochondral defects. The TBL medial condyle has gone down, eroded. The, there's a big osteophyte on the femur side. The whole tibia is subluxating, subluxating laterally, and the thrust is there. Whenever she wait, wants to take weight, she cannot because the tibia goes laterally. We have tried giving a hinge brace and walker, then only she can move up to the toilet, that's all. This lady has been on teriparatide since last 9 months and she is a rheumatoid. So look at the lateral side, there is a big defect, you can see the cortical defect here. So based on this x-rays what we have to be prepared with, we have to be prepared with to do a bone graft. If the plate, tibia plate is not stable, we'll have to use a stem device. Considering the laxity, we must be prepared with some sort of constraint, if at all it is required. But still, what I practice is doing minimal resection of the bone, see the gap, try to fill up the gap with the prosthesis, trying to restore the joint line. These are the principles I like to practice, and these are the options which I have in my hand when I'm doing a surgery. These are the bailout procedures. A hinge joint also can be kept as a bailout procedure. If you, but if you ask me, I don't think she requires a hinge. Because clinically, this is a correctable virus, but it doesn't go beyond a certain limit. That means the virus is there, but it is not going into a valgus. That means the medial collateral is still intact. So these are the couple of points which I would like to emphasize before starting the surgery. Again, Dr. A. S. Prasad from Kanpur. I'll be again showing the virus knee but in a different way. You see, the, I'll be doing the left knee. You can appreciate the bone loss here, the shift to the valgus side, the lateral side. And if you look at the left side, you can appreciate a bone loss here on the tibial condyle. So we are prepared with a bone stem, the stem, and also prepared to do a graft if need arises. Let us. Uh, so friends, hi, this is Dr. S. Prashad from Kanpur, and I'm just showing this video of my surgery of this patient which you just saw the x-ray. For exposure nothing changes in whatever the patients are. All the knee are exposed in the same way, same anterior midline or little medial incision. We all examine, all the patients are examined under anesthesia to see how much laxity is there and any deformity which we can assess, we saw that it has got too much of laxity but not going heavier, number one, and doesn't have a flexion deformity. Tunique is applied, I, pref I still prefer using a tunique. Exposure is same, the medial parapetal autotomy going down up to the tibial tuberosity, the incision, whether I use a knife or a diathermy cutting, has to go absolutely to the bone. 
the entire horn of the medial meniscus is in size and then by keeping lifting that area we will lift the soft tissue over the proximal tibia proximally we have to cut the capsule the under part of the vastus medialis and the capsule and the bursa superiorly just make a nick into the fibers of fibers of the vastus medialis and the moment we stretch the patella uh, the fibers separate and we never have to close that also so taking making a soft tissue sleeve inside which we are going to work taking it soft tissue away from the proximal tibia the anterior medial part going till the mid part of the coronal plane of the tibia so nothing separate we have to ensure because there is a big bony defect over the tibia we have to ensure that we do not damage the soft tissue there keep it closed and then going into the bursa there and taking out the fibre of fat it will facilitate the eversion or subluxation of the patella for the surgery it will expose the tibia and distal femur take out couple of strands of fibrous attachment of ligamentum patelli to the tibia there it really loosens the patella and then we can avert it and flex the knee or we can subluxate it and flex the knee so but the there have been uh, quite a talk about damaging the vascular supply of the patella but now meta analysis has proved that whether you avert or you subluxate it doesn't change any dynamics or any vascularity of the patella blood supply already discussed in the last surgical video how i tackle my patella mostly i do not now i do not do any patella button in all the cases in selective cases yes especially in revisions i do use a patella button because the femoral component is not anatomical or physiological properly not taking out all the ossified and you can appreciate the yellow color of this articular surface of the patella that shows the cartilage is intact so why bother poor patella rasping the cut edges making it smooth and that's it i prefer to do tibia first in selective cases where they may have got too much of flexion deformity and then i try to do a distal femur first a homen will go over the lateral meniscus on the lateral side and you retract the patella away exposes the lateral condyle as well as the entire part of the lateral tibial surface the excision of the medial uh, left lateral meniscus and we can always keep a small rim of lateral meniscus on the lateral side to protect the inferior genicular artery which is there otherwise we can always ligate it the moment you cut it you can see a punctate point there ligate it they have in the x-ray we have seen there's a big piece chunk of medial condyle which has broken down and uh, broken and lying down attached in the medial mcl so i'll try to take that out palpate it find out their margins and there's so many things which which we can see I use a hemostat, sometimes a periosteum to get it out. We are just clearing out all the fibrous tissues there, and so that this piece which was has broken down and gone down can be taken off. To remove it, I. can you the dathermy which i usually do or we can use a knife as also just keep it absolutely on the surface of the bone we should not invade the other soft tissue that is it is because it is attached to the medial complex the medial collateral ligament so just we have to be very careful 
in removing those small pieces which are there and show that the jasmine jasmine tip or the knife doesn't go or damage the medial structures there You can appreciate a big defect and the slope of the keyvel condyle. Make take out the anterior osteophyte so that my jig, the keyvel cutting jib, can be placed well there. The depth of the cut, I usually prefer to cut it less than 10 millimeter and at the widest part of the tibia which is possible, so that I'll get a good cut surface of tibia, and then see. So it cannot be too less, it cannot be too more and the critical is 10 millimeter from the healthy lateral condyle. Alignment is checked as standard, the distal part of the rod is kept over the entire crest of tibia, just proximal to the ankle joint. I'm sorry I have not used the stylus, I do not use the stylus because I can always assess how much the thickness is but yes, using a stylus gives you a lot of idea how much thickness of tibia we are going to cut. I do add. Seven. So my husband say that it is, I have cut 7 millimeter from the convex surface of the tibial condyle. And if we measure from the anterior osteophyte, osteophytes are quite thick and splayed over the rim of the tibia. So do we, if we assess from there, the depth will be definitely de different. So assess from the cartilaginous portion of the apex of the convex surface of the lateral condyle. If it is eroded, you must get less. Again, I'll check with a rod and see whether the cut is perpendicular or not. If not, because most of the time in a closed medial condyle, it cuts less on the medial side. So the cut goes into a valgus cut. So we can always freehand get it balanced well. So this couple of millimeter of cut and making it smooth will always help you because otherwise your, your stem will go into valgus. So this cross checking is absolutely essential and when I have been using a computer then also after cutting I see that what computer is saying is right or not. So it's manual checking, it's manual computer which will tell you whether our cut is good or bad. I'm using the tribal tray of PFC Sigma because if if at all I have to use a stem then we have got stem available in PFC Sigma. In Attune knee still they have not supplied us the stem for femur or tibia. So I keep on checking because I will try to go to the lateral side as possible if it's, it's ob obstruction I'll do a good clearance because in a small tibia where lots of lots of bone is there on the middle side sometimes I'll try to go a little mm -hmm. lateral and get a overhang of one millimeter on the lateral side also. So these are the things which keep on going how much overhang we can go how much lateralized we can do the tibia tray so that the defect becomes less in ratio in proportion and can we undersize the tibia also that is very important that some doctors who practice that. For femur again same 
making a whole intramedullary canal, sucking the fluid from the intramedullary canal. The rod should go very slow so that the pressure doesn't rise. The usual principle, the principal friends will remain same. Defect or no defect, ligament laxity or no laxity, the principle is same, cut in a proper alignment, cut less bone to start with, do everything, then see the trial, how travel behaves and then we can, if we want, we can do a constraint, if we want, we can fill up the defect with bone graft. I have not, I can see osteophytes on the rim of the medial and lateral condyle, but I have not bothered to even remove them. After the distal femoral cut, all these osteophytes become very, very visible and most of the surface osteophytes are lost. So removing those osteophytes is much, much easier than take, taking the osteotoma and trying to cut them. So we have cut 9 mm from the lateral femoral condyle and 8 mm from the medial side. That's, that's pretty okay. So we have not cut less bone. Now you can visualize, you can see all the osteophytes and then removing them becomes very easy now. They start falling off. You see, you touch them, they come out from the margin and you can see the normal anatomy of the femoral becomes visible. And this osteophyte which is just beneath the MCL attachment will offload the whole medial complex. One more thing is left that is the posterior medial portion of the MCL which will be done when we have done the posterior condylar cut. So in a difficult case I think it's better to see how much gap we have created. It's 8 that means 9 and 8. Now we are taking with 10 that means 10 and 9. 9 millimeter for distal femur and 10 millimeter of tibial insert. So total gap created is 19 millimeter. So still we can create and go for a bigger insert. So, so with this 19 millimeter we'll go and try to create same gap on the posterior femoral side. So and a rectangular gap. Mind. So this is just an idea. Ultimate balancing will be done with the trials only. So this gives us some idea how much gap we have created by proximal tibial cut and this tell few more cut. Now I'll just clear the lateral surface which I usually do in all the cases so that I can visualize where my tibial component will sit. So now I am testing with the Attune tray, and this is size 2, it's pretty small but it is very small enteroposterior mm -hmm. on the lateral side. So we have to fill the lateral part, we will try to get the tibial tray sitting on the rim of the cortex, that is important. So this is size 3 and now we assess how much mm -hmm. overhang we have. This is almost less than 10 percent and the tibial tray looks very stable. So that's why uh, probably I opted out from the PFC Sigma because the defect now overall is almost 10 percent only.
so we don't have to use this stem. In fact, uh, when I started doing my, sur my surgery, so in a small defect also a graft, I would always go for a cement. Mm -hmm. Now we have got more selection criteria to assess how the defect behaves. So up to 20% of the defects, we may or may not use a stem depending upon how stable the tibial tray is and the defect, the depth will ensure what we are going to do. We are going to use a graft, we are going to use a screw and cement or if it is a contained defect only cement. So it is not a contained defect, mostly in the virus it is a posterior medial defect and not a contained, contained defect. If a contained defect definitely we can use only cement and that's okay. So now we are setting with the spacer how much flexion gap we are going to create. So we remember the total gap created was 19 millimeter with a I think uh, yeah so this is 9, 9, 18 so we are uh, so 18 millimeter is shows good stable gap we are going to create and the, the gap is a rectangle. If would not have been rectangle, we could have just rotated the jig a little to create a rectangle gap. That one. If wanted to create little more gap, we can just take the jig by one millimeter or one hole more. By entirely, if wanted to reduce the flexion gap, we can take the jig jig by one millimeter down or posteriorly. So these all things we can play. We have to ensure that we do not jog, the, uh, do not notch the anterior cortex of the femur. We have to ensure that we do not, our blade doesn't go into the MCL origin also. So these are the small things we can always play to create a good flexion gap which is equal to the extension gap and it is rectangle in nature. You see the proximal tibia and distal femur cut is uniform. You can use any jig to create a good gap in extension. When these cuts are there, this is, these are implant specific. To conform to the internal geometry of the implant which we are going to use. So then these, this is a specific jig we have to use for that implant. So I am using a tune. This is a tune jig. While, while being no, I think the next will be notch plastic, but I'll tell you about the defect handling again because that's very important. So don't be frightened. It's less than 10%. So we can use a graft if the really depth is very high, but the depth up to 15 millimeter to 20 millimeter, we can fill the defect with a screw and cement technology or technique where the screw heads and the screw body will act like a concrete reinforcement where the cement is held by wire mesh or steel rod. So the same technique is used and this uh, now is standard technique for small defect. A contained defect has to be can be filled by cement or bone graft. A big defect can be filled by bone graft or cement and the screw and cement it came wire off. When I started using this technique way back and I have done total more than 150 cases where I have used a single screw, a K wire or something. Initially I was always reinforcing such construct with a stem. Then gradually we got to know the total surface and more evidences crop in so you get to know and you can start feeling good and because we cement this short stem of the, our implant also. So sometimes now long stems are not required in every case. If we have got 30% of the T well defect with a graft, then probably it's always safe to use a cement to offload that. Yes, stem, cemented stem to offload that. So 
in this case it is less than 15 percent maybe 10 percent of bone defect so i'll be using only screws and cement and that's why i shifted to a tune because a tune doesn't have a stem facility till now in india this technique is not new in fact freeman started in early 1980s then Ritter published two papers in 93, 94, 2 I think, 93 and they are very, very important, they are big series of cases. Then we have got a good follow up now and it has been said that the follow up studies have shown that the outcome or the longevity of the TBL stem with the screw cement and the normal TBL stem is no different and that's very heartening. And that's why we do it now more often for a small defect. So the outcome or the longevity yes. survivorship is same in a normal TBL cut and with tibia with a, where you have done it to up to 20% of defect with screw and bone cement. A couple of papers from China are very interesting. They have, uh, they are showing a couple of things. They say that vertical screws are better, number one. Number two, they say the surface of the screw head must be touching the TBL implant to get a, and that provides a better support to the TBL implant. Uh, the long, long term studies are still awaited. So I still practice where my screw head, there's a gap of one millimeter between my screw head surface and the TBL tray if I'm using a screw and cement. So one millimeter cement mantle between these two is good, but if that cement mantle is thicker, that tends to crack. So that is that is that is what evidence tells us. So we are trying the trialing, and uh, I think we are going for a five looks a little wobbly. So we are going for seven insert. That means the total depth we are uh, total. Uh, gap creation is 9 millimeter plus 11 millimeter that means total 20 millimeter of gap has been created which will be, which are being filled now so let's see with the seven yes yeah seven good looks good tight not getting into hyper extension not getting a full extension also is stable and stable in medial laterally also we can assess how much it opens it should open 2 to 4 millimeter on either side and that we always in difficult cases it's always good to see just just have a nice idea though your hands are the biggest tools which will tell you how it feels but yes it looks good so total gap created uh, is total 20 millimeter of gap which is being filled by a uh, processes and you can see the tracking the patella tracks so well that the femoral component rotation is ad absolutely bang on your particular tracking is an issue if your femoral component has not been rotated adequately. That rotation varies from person to person. Every anatomy is different. With the computer navigation, I used, I gave a paper way back by measuring all the axes. And I can tell you 60% of the my patient, that was a study of 200 patients. 60% of the patient had external rotation of 3 degrees and around 30% had external rotation of 5 degrees. Then there were patients where no, no rotation was required and there were patients where even 7 degrees of external rotation was required and that was very tricky because the moment you rotate so much, uh, you look that posterior condylar cut may jeopardize your MCL also. So you have to be very careful and ensure that your cut doesn't go and hit the posterior condyle also, posterior cortex of the femur. So these are the things which we have to show. But yes, 60 to 70 percent of the joints will require only 3 degrees of external rotation. So they are in majority. In couple of, in small numbers, you may have to titrate it. Just clearing the surface so that it becomes surf, uh, it doesn't have any fibrous tissue so that the cement is well incorporated over the surface of the bone that is the idea curate it out 
make certain drill holes and a couple of screws should be good. Single screw or couple of screws will depend on the surface area we have. And now more these screws, they have been papers which have shown even three screws, four screws they have used depending upon what surface area has to have cement. I always make a screw holes once the tibia has been in place. The idea is we know where the hole should lead. It cannot, it should not interfere with the actual stem of the tibia we are going to use. That's my take. But you can use, even now, if, if you know the anatomy, you can do it freehand, otherwise also. Setting a mark just to ensure the proper rotation of the tube tray is there. These are all the standard steps, Not, nothing, nothing extra. So you see, we have done everything as we do in any case, any case. So it's a very predictable and reproductive step and very repetitive step. Small tweaking, handling of soft, soft tissue is very essential. Don't try to cut a lot. Don't try to cut a lot of bone. Don't try to damage the soft tissue. The soft tissue sleeve on inside which we are working has to be preserved well. The two holes have been made. We know it is not going to interfere with the stem of the tibia. Two titanium screw will be put in and I always use a cap, I already told you, between the surface of the screw and the surface of the implant which will be just over them. My friend has given a little smaller screw, I would have preferred me. Usually I prefer size 30. And I am using a small head. Uh, uh, the literature says 6.5 millimeter screws, but our, our tibia is small, so I use 4.5 or 5 millimeter screws. These are 4 millimeter screws. In fact, uh, Paul Latko also, in the of CCJR fame, also published a paper on the same technique. making a screw holes. In fact, uh, I uh, normally don't use drill, I use thick K wires to make a smooth holes. Drills take out a lot of bone from there. So, I can, so smooth thick K wires, 2 millimeter K wires or 2.5 millimeter K wires are good to make a small hole. And the holes should not be too, the depth should be hardly 4 millimeter, 2 to 4 millimeter. This is what my usual story is. And now I'm preparing for cement with after the injection of a cocktail. The cocktail has got boot trim and long acting and local anesthetic. This combination. I do not use this steroid. I do not use antibiotics in that. The cement I use with antibiotics, the, but built in antibiotic. I don't try to mix antibiotics myself. So I use a gentamicin cement in all practical all the cases. Why not? That is the idea. If there are some antibiotics in there. So this injection is of cocktail and I'm preparing for the cementation now. For cementing, I do pose the surfaces. That means I'll apply cement on the cut bony surfaces and also apply on the cement on the surface of the implant. 
the idea is to pressurize and the, during pressurization there will be cement everywhere. Sometimes if it is on the single surface with the uneven pressure, the cement uh, pushes, pushed out of the surface. So, and the meta-analysis is there which has been published to show that if you have cement, cement over both the surfaces, it's much better to oh. get a better uniform cement mantle under the implant. You can always unscrew the head so that the length of the screw can become more. So that again is on a hand before we apply the final implant, we can check it thousand times wherever we want. Just ensure that everything is on the right track. So with the fingertips, I will try to pressurize the cement into the bone as much as possible. That's number one. Number two, I don't try to use hard cement. I try to start using the tibial uh, pushing at one minute and uh, at four, three to four million minutes, I start press, pressing the cement on the femoral side. If you remember, Dr. Rana was suggested and he used to practice using cement with a syringe the liquid cement used to pour over the cut surface of the bone. This was his practice and I, he used to have two packets of cement different, one for the tibia, one for the femur. However, I do in one packet, but I make it fast and with a temperature of 18 degrees in my, my operation greater, I think it works well. So, cement on both the surfaces, pressure is well, and in fourth minute, I am applying third to fourth minute. I will be applying cement on the femur side. I will remove the extra cement later on. Most of the time, I use a knife or a hemostat, small mosquito, to take it out. For unique compartmental, I definitely I use my orthoscopic probe to take out cement from the posterior part of the implant but here we don't do that. The defect has to be pressurized with the cement. That thing, but the extra cement will be taken out. You can just rub it and take out the extra cement. With the thumb you can rub out, rub it out after pressurization and take out this extra cement from that surface also. So that that area has to be pressurized well. The defect with the screws like that couple of fingers are there. And that's, I think it's my finger or my assistant Dr. Amit Verma, I do not know. But anyway, I have got two very good associates working with me. That That way the uh, surgery becomes a cakewalk sometimes. Dr. Amit Verma, who is with me since last 15 years, he has got his own independent practice. But for all surgeries, he is there from planning to execution stage. And uh, he, he, he is uh, practically has assisted uh, or worked with me for more than 5,000 right now. Then I've got a rotating fellow who uh, used to come and work with me. We had fellows, a couple of fellows from Andhra and one from Tamil Nadu also. And I definitely had a lot of rotating fellows from Uttaranchal, Bihar and UP. Now I've got one a fellow, Dr. Adit Narula, who's with me since last year, last year more than little more than a year. And he intends to stay with me because he intends to settle in Kanto. So that's a good news because he will be there. He is five year post MS and has worked in Delhi for a couple of fellowships for orthoscopy. And I always want people to go and work at other places. I just sent Dr. Nubla to Dr. Obrai, who is a great friend of me in Delhi. So that the small trips people can keep on learning from everyone. The concept, nobody can change, but the small tricks, the tips and pearls, we all evolve and practice our own thing. So we keep on learning from everyone. Our Arthroplasty Society meeting, which has been happening every year since 2005, uh, live surgery, the workshops and training module, unfortunately, was not held last year because of the COVID. 
and I uh, hope this year we'll be able to do something. We always had very good faculty and live surgeries in those workshops, apart from those fellowship programs which I have. So I, have, I think we have been able to transform the whole character of the Central India in the field of joint placement. And last three, uh, my meeting initially started with basic concepts and basic teaching. Now last three meetings, I'm focusing on case presentation. There are so many young doctors who are doing good cases. Why not come and present cases? And we can discuss if what are the downsides, what could have been done to make it better and their outcomes also. So that's, that's again, I hope this year we'll be able to do, if not, will do a virtual program. Though I can, I can tell you my my take, I, I'm not very comfortable with virtual program. It's always very good to interact personally from each other. But anyway, if we, if we don't have anything, definitely we'll go for a virtual program this year. We're already trying with the idea. We can have two surgeries, one from Kanpur, mm -hmm. one from some other good joint placement centers of India. Maybe. I'll request Dr. Vijay Bose to demonstrate a hip from his center in Chennai. So that's all, the friends. We'll pressurize it, wait to, till this event. The closer will be done as an absolute watertight closer. Ensure that the sleeve is not tightened so that there's no mismatch in the length. So the, if you start the closer in 30 degree of flexion, that's best. So that will give you insight that you do not overlap your stitches well and my team is very well versed. They have been trained by great surgeons from all over the world who have come to Kanpur and demonstrated surgery. And my Dr. Amit Verma and my other fellows, my other assistants have worked with them. So they have taken out small tricks from all the surgeons who have worked here, from Indian as well as foreigners especially from England, from Germany, Germany, because my training initially was from Germany. I've got five fellows from fellowship from Germany only. So definitely German doctors have been visiting me a lot. So bye friends. Now we'll discuss with the uh, post-op x-ray. I just, I'll tell you at the end, the other knee was done also by me later on. And that also needed a couple of screws the same way though defect was lesser in that and the lady uh, is absolutely walking delighted because she is still using a stick uh, I do I told her to now she can forget stick also but uh, she is still using a stick because she has got so much of deformity in the hand in the toes also and the ankle also. she is a burnout good case of rheumatoid still on methotrexate and full white but most other drugs have been stopped and she's on teriparatide i told you since last nine months which is being still being continued it will be continued for minimum one year we can go up to the two years we all know that Hi, thank you this is the post-op x-ray of the patient which i just demonstrated the surgery so what we have done after doing a resection and trying to fill up the gap we have not used a graph because the defect was small. Looks good. We have left. We did not go for a big posterior clearance also because we didn't want to get a much bigger gap there also. And we shifted the femur a little down. It's just flush with the anterior cortex. And we have not used the stem also because I think the stem was not required. And the, we, during surgery, we appreciated the bone was not so bad. Probably it was because of nine months of teriparatide. But still, when we allow her to walk, we'll be using a brace and walker for three to four weeks while walking. Definitely exercises have been started and she has started walking also with a walker and a brace. So the brace will go off into three to four weeks, depending upon how good are the muscles, and definitely that will heal the soft tissue element of uh, all around the knee. But otherwise, I think it's stable, and when you want, we can always post a one year, two year follow up of uh, x-ray. And small defects, I have been practicing this 
the couple of the screws and K wire initially, and it has worked very well. I have used it with PFC Sigma. The only couple of things, your head, there should be a gap of one millimeter to two millimeter between the head and the surface of the implant, so that which is filled by the cement. That is important. Nothing more. Thank you for watching the video.